Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we can't see you, um, but so uh, it's great to have you all with us. Um, uh, it's it's really exciting tonight to have Lex with us. Uh, you know, being able to do this virtually has given us a special opportunity because uh, Lex is in LA and normally since we're based in New York, um, we wouldn't be able to have her with us. So I'm super excited about this. My name is Kim Moy. I'm one of the organizers of UX and Data. Um, and when I'm not doing this, I'm a senior design manager at, at Capital One. Um, I couldn't do this alone, so I also have uh, two co-organizers, um, Bill Prickett, uh, who also has his own post-production company from uh, Prickett Media. Bill, do you want to say hi? Hi there. How are you? I'm having a good time and um, hope you're enjoying it and hope you will. Lex is a lot of fun. And also, I'm over here too. <laughs> and. Uh, so Bill puts together videos of our events. So if you ever miss one of them, uh, you can catch it later and hopefully uh, share the event out with your friends. And then we also have uh, Matt Weber, who's actually the founder of our meetup. Uh, Matt, you want to say hi? Uh, hey, everyone. Nice to see you, or a couple of you. Um, and Matt is the VP of Product at Development Guild, which is a um, awesome consulting firm for nonprofits. So if you get a chance, uh, check them out. Um, we also couldn't do this without our friends at General Assembly. Um, they have allowed us to be able to have uh, a lot more people together with us here virtually. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lauren for a moment. Thanks, Kim, um, and thank you so much for everyone joining tonight. Usually we're doing this in Flatiron with tons of pizza, and Bill and me are laughing at some jokes, so I'm glad we could do this again virtually. Um, so I'm an events producer at General Assembly. I have the pleasure of working with different partners in New York um, to just host free events. Um, so feel free to, I encourage you to, to take a look at our website uh, now that we're now virtual. Um, there is usually something happening um, every night or even in the middle of the day. Um, and you have the opportunity to learn things in UX design, data, software engineering, marketing. I mean, it's really a, all across the gambit of, of topics. I like to tell folks uh, GA is just a resource for you no matter where you are in your career. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for joining and I'm, I'm really excited for Lex's presentation. Thanks for having us, Kim. Oh, thanks, Lauren. So now, um, on to the show. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Lex Roman. Um, Lex is a product designer whose focus is on the impact of design. Um, Lex runs her own independent growth design practice, taking on projects, workshops, and coaching. She works with teams to align business and customer value, so growth is human-centric. In addition to design, she has deep expertise in product analytics, customer development, and experimentation. Past work includes the Black Tux, Envision, Burner, Toyota, Prosper, and Nissan. Lex, take it away. Before I start, are, did, is the general assembly that y'all meet at in the Flatiron building? Not in the building, but oh. it's very close by. I have because I have the Flatiron building behind me. Can you see that? <laughs> that is a that is very. Uh, we can this we can kind of see it. Yeah, so it's it's a, a, we can all feel like we're in New York, even those of us who are not in New York. Yes, it's a good a good connection. My my dad wanted everyone to know that we used to take a ride on Twenty Third from Broadway before you couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. All right, let me take over the screen share. We'll get this going. So I'm super excited to be here because when I first learned about UX and data, um, I was so bummed that it was in New York and that I was in LA and I couldn't attend. And so I am thrilled to be here with all of you. I've always wanted to go to this meetup. And so here we are, I'm really excited. Um, so I'm Lex Roman, like Kim said, I'm based in Los Angeles. I run my own independent practice now. Um, and tonight I wanna share with you a bit about how I came to call myself a growth designer um, and the history of my work that brought me to that place. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of our time talking about how I see that role and that skill set, um, and how you can practice it or elements of it in your own work, no matter where you are or what you do uh, with design and with growth. I've linked everything up on my website. So if you go to lexroman.com resources, 
um, you can click on practicing growth design there. And so everything is in there that you could possibly read or watch about this talk. So again, we'll start with how I got here. I'm gonna walk you a little bit through my career history in UX. Um, I will share why I think you should care about growth design, why it's so important to me, and then we'll talk about how you actually do it. So first, how I got here. I started my career uh, at a, an agency called Kluge. Um, and Kluge would get all kinds of clients, uh, startups, nonprofits, and, and people would come in with a goal, which makes sense, right? You, you want a website, you want an app, you've got a goal. And they would say something like, we want to sell more this. We want to get more people into email subscriptions. We want to sell more um, pottery. And, and we would say, well, how are you doing on that now? And very often they would look at us and go, we don't actually know. We have no idea how we're doing. And, and one of the projects that we took on um, when I was working there was for this, this company called 9-11 Day, which some of you might be familiar with. They're, they are based in New York. And the idea is that on 9-11, folks can pledge to do a good deed. So they're a nonprofit. They want to honor 9-11 with people doing good deeds. And the challenge that they were having was that people would go to the website and not pledge to do a good deed, which was the point of the website. And so we looked at this and we thought about ways that we could improve it. Um, they didn't know, you know how, how this was doing on the analytics side. They didn't know how many people were coming to the page. They didn't know where they were losing them. Um, and so we did a bunch of different changes using design, using messaging, clarifying what the website was for and what they wanted you to do. And then we instrumented analytics and we measured the difference between what they had and what we changed. And for me, this process was incredibly powerful. The idea that we could use design not only to change how people interacted with something, not only to improve the outcomes for this nonprofit, but we could prove that design was the factor here. Um, and, and this was really successful. We got, we boosted pledges for them, you know, multiple times over. I want to say it was like two or 300%, just because the difference between putting the messaging there and making the pledge clear and not, that's the delta for getting people to take the action. And at this time, I was just starting to get into UX and I was taking a class in LA um, at UCLA Extension from a designer named Jamie Levy, who we'll talk more about. And Jamie taught UX through the lens of business. So she, she talked about UX as a fundamental part of business success. We read stuff like The Lean Startup. We talked about the viability of businesses and how the design of those products and services plays into the viability. So when I first started learning UX, I thought, this is what UX is. UX is about business. Um, and I learned later that that's not always the case. So I took this idea, the Lean Startup practice, up to the Bay Area and I started working with large companies. So I'd been working with startups. I went and worked with Toyota um, to try to help them get into a new market. They wanted to validate a new product. And so we did a lot of work talking with customers, doing prototypes. They put an Android tablet in their Toyota prototypes, um, their prototype cars, and they would send customers out with different versions of this idea. And so this was more on the innovation side. And this was, I thought this was great. We could use startup pr principles in these huge corporations. But the challenge that we had was that ultimately we were so far from when they would actually go to market with this. We could sort of get these lightweight signals, you know, were people responding to a prototype? Were we hearing the pain points from customer interviews? We couldn't ultimately measure 
how much this would drive for Toyota. It was too, we were too far from the release of this product. And around this time, I ended up going to a firm called Carbon5, which also has an office in New York. Um, Carbon5 is a product development shop. And we did a project for this company called Prosper, which is a loan, like a, a personal loan company. At the time they were doing peer-to-peer -peer lending. I think they're, they've moved on from that. But you know, people can request loans for their cars or for their weddings or for, for debt consolidation. And they wanted us to do a responsive redesign of their website. And surprise, surprise, they had a big ambitious goal. They wanted us to boost loan applications on mobile. And this is where I found my sweet spot. I learned that this was exactly the kind of company I wanted to work with. They had a lot of customers. They had product market fit. So there were resources. There were you know, team members that I could work with internally. Um, there were customers I could interview. There were numbers if I wanted to run an A-B test. There was volume there. But they were still in this place where I could see the metrics, I could measure success, I could try stuff that was like maybe a little unconventional. Like at one point, I put my own phone number on their homepage uh, to do customer interviews, which was really fun. Um, and that, that is where this idea of growth design started to click. This idea that growth stage companies could have a lot of success, they could have customers, they could be profitable, but they could still be struggling to get over that, that hump, that next scalability. Um, and this is where I could really leverage design. These are some of, our, uh, some of our different design tests there, just using interaction design as a way to move loan applications forward. And this was, this was a hugely successful project um, focusing on mobile, getting so many more applications on mobile than desktop um, in our, some of our early tests. And around this time, I started reading about Sean Ellis's work in growth. Um, and, and growth, if you're not familiar with it, is the idea that, that you intentionally focus on growing a company or an organization. So previously, um, in tech at least, you know, folks were just doing what they thought was best for the user. Um, or, or doing what they thought made sense, but not necessarily intentionally focusing on growing the business. And the idea of growth or growth hackers is that you have to put resources there. If you want to grow your business, someone or some set of people have to focus on growing the business. Um, this book came out later, but I, I definitely recommend it. And Sean at this time was putting out a lot of content around how you grow businesses um, and, and growing businesses is a cross-functional practice, not just, obviously not just a design practice as we'll cover. From my work at Carbon5, I decided I wanted to just work with growth stage companies. I wanted to work with companies that had some customers, they had product market fit, but they had gaps. They had issues that I could use design to solve. So at Burner, I focused a lot on um, this burner is a mobile app where you download, you make burner numbers for a variety of use cases, not for drugs, um, for things like Craigslist or online dating and stuff like that. So this is where I focused on getting people into subscriptions. And I spent a lot of time talking with customers about what value they saw in burner. I talked to customers who didn't see any value in burner, people that dropped off right away. Um, and I used that to generate more successful design. So on the left, you see their early subscription page. Probably you can just see some flaws in it <laughs> on the visual side anyway, but we learned a lot of things about this customer base and we were able to solve for the customer problem while solving the business problem. So that's what's really compelling about growth design. The idea that you're not just solving for the customer, you're not just solving for the business, you're doing both. Um, and the same idea I took with me to the Black Tux, this was my most recent in-house um, gig, where I focused on the checkout process. So the Black Tux does tuxedo and suit rentals for weddings and special events. 
and they had a big problem on their checkout page, which is classic for e-commerce. It was kind of weird for them because you had to do so much work to get there. You had to pick out all these different elements of your suit, your bow tie, your shoes. You had to do the same thing for your whole wedding party. You had to get everyone's sizing in. Um, so by the time you made it to checkout, you had done all this work and yet we were losing all these people. Um, and I spent a lot of time looking at the data, trying to understand where we were losing people, talking with customers, going to physical showrooms. Um, and we, we did a lot of work um, to boost this. We were, we were really successful here using design and iterative testing to increase checkout conversion. Without manipulating people, we're not doing dark patterns here, right? It's what we're trying to find is a gap in the UX that's causing a problem for the business. And now um, I do, you know, sort of on the side, I've kept for years sort of separate from my work in the private sector. I do a lot of work in my community around uh, particularly homelessness and now civic education. Um, and so more recently, I've been using this sort of growth skill set in my community in particular working on this project uh, for the People's Budget LA Coalition, which is led by Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. They've been doing this work for a long time. Um, and I, I just recently started working with them in May. But one thing we've, we've seen success with is using these same principles on the website, in social media, to explain really complex government processes, what action we want people to take and to compel them to take that action. So it's not that fun or easy to call into a city council meeting and give public comment, but we've broken that down for them. Um, and, and it's been really successful. We've gotten a lot of people to take action. As a result, we're seeing action uh, in our government. So that's been really powerful. And that has brought me to this place where I am trying to shift and expand how I think about growth design. Um, and I would encourage all of you to do the same, to think about what impact really means in your profession and in your life um, and how you can frame it beyond profits if you're working in the private sector um, and think a bit more broadly about the human impact of our work. How can we measure impact um, because ultimately, I think most designers want to solve problems. We want to improve people's lives. So how do we look at that? How do we measure that? Uh, most importantly, how do we affect that? If I haven't convinced you yet why I think you should care about growth and growth design, we're now going to talk more about why I think you should. The ceiling cannot hold us when we can prove the impact of our work. So how often have you all heard, what's the ROI of design? I mean, are we sure we need a designer on the team? Like what business value does design really offer, right? This is a conversation we're having all the time. It is what causes designers to be paid less than their fellow cross-functional partners, product management, data, and software engineering. It is what causes companies to start by hiring a founding CTO, but to outsource design or to hire a junior designer or to hire an intern, right? It's this discrepancy of understanding. Well, clearly we need a very talented, qualified engineer, but design is just a checkbox. And we saw this play out when Sean Ellis and other leaders started talking about growth as a practice. When they you know, started popularizing the idea of a growth hacker or a growth team, design was not a part of the conversation. And when people started hiring practitioners into their companies to make sure that their companies grew, um, they weren't hiring designers. They were hiring PMs, they were hiring engineers or folks with technical backgrounds, they were hiring marketers. And design was sort of off to the side. And there are some, there are some companies, you know, 
designers were involved in some of these companies. Um, and you'll hear designers talk about, like the designers at Dropbox will say, well, we had a growth design team at Dropbox, but no one was talking about that publicly. When you went to a growth conference, even still, if you go to a growth conference, there are almost no designers on the stage, like zero, maybe one. Um, there were no design leaders talking about growth, how they use design to grow companies. So even if internally there were some designers involved at Slack, Airbnb, Uber, on growth teams, no one was saying that out loud. And this has been captured by other growth leaders. Um, Casey Winters most notably wrote about this, about how design was sort of strategically left out or purposely left out. Um, and now there's a clash where design and growth are opposed, um, or there was until designers started taking the lead. And so the goal really is not to just say that design matters, but to prove that design matters industry-wide and in your own work. And this comes down to owning the value of design. So to give you a, a simple definition of, of growth design, growth design is the combination of the growth skill set and the design skill set. So growth, the intentional focus on driving business impact with all of the design skills we know and love, most notably delivering real customer value. So growth design is a specialization of design that focuses at the intersection of these two things. And this is, this is a pretty notable new specialization of design. Just to give you a little bit of a uh, comparison, product design is still really relevant. Product design here can sub in for UX um, or, or interaction designer, um, still really critical. Growth design is a specialization, like visual design, like UX research, right? Design is a really broad field. So what we're introducing here is just a specialization. It's, the, it's an additional depth that someone can develop as a designer. The main differences are that, that typical product designers work across an experience. So they're working thoroughly to make sure that all T's are crossed and all I's are dotted, right? And that everything is functioning across an experience. Growth practitioners are focused only in areas of growth, of high impact, right? Signups, retention, revenue, making sure that customers are, are coming and that they're staying and that they're paying. So areas of impact, not necessarily the thorough experience, which is necessary, but not gonna drive the business forward. Um, product designers tend to focus on user pain. Growth designers are focusing on the intersection of pain and business opportunity. Um, so we're losing people at this page. There's probably user pain there, but there's also business pain. Product designers hopefully always understand the goals, right? Hopefully everyone understands why we're working on something, but growth designers and growth practitioners are really involved in the planning and tracking of those goals. They are looking at data very often and they are hands-on with that. They can tell you how their work is doing. They're reviewing experiment reports, right? Acting on that information rather than just, you know, hearing from a PM, oh, conversion is down. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Um, and again, shipping complete features, it, critically important, right? We can't have software without completeness. You can't just leave users hanging. But growth designers tend to ship to learn. Things that are lightweight, they're doing iterations, they're building on things uh, to sort of try to knock, knock on all these doors and figure out which one opens. And just to highlight for you, in the last four years since I've been talking and writing about growth design, I have seen an explosion of people hiring for this role. And it tends to be called uh, product designer comma growth um, or 
product designer, comma, retention, product designer, comma, acquisition, things like that. We're also seeing hiring at the leadership level. So directors of design for growth, um, particularly at places like Netflix and Slack and Spotify. This is the growth designers. Um, .co website, you can see some jobs up there. So now let's talk about how you actually design for growth. Blinded by the light. You are blinded by the light of growth design, which is so compelling, you will never turn away. <laughs> So mapping to the things that we just talked about, focusing on the high areas of impact, looking at missed opportunities, shipping to learn, and measuring success along the way, these are our four skill areas for growth designers. And these are really similar for other growth practitioners, growth engineers, growth product managers. Um, but I find that designers have sort of underdeveloped some of these skill sets in comparison to their colleagues, and that's why I'm focusing on them. So we'll start with goal setting and prioritization. We are the champions of goal setting. So goal setting is something that I find designers usually take a backseat to. They often let PMs or their directors um, or managers sort of do this and hand them something to respond to. Um, and that, that may not be the case on your team, but I have seen that many times. And the key to success in growth is strong, clear, measurable goals. Um, and so it's really important that, that if you're not driving this process, that you're actively participating in it with your teammates, um, that you're, you know, poking on, flaws in the goals or that, that you're helping to shape the goals. And I think the biggest mistake that I see people make is way too many goals. If you're shipping on a featured team, if you're a product designer who's in charge of shipping features, you can have multiple goals because you can achieve multiple tasks. But in growth, it's, you're not achieving tasks. You're looking at outcomes. So you don't know how you're going to get up revenue and it, you can't necessarily commit to multiple goals. You need to just focus on that one thing to give you an example of this. When I was at burner, we had a lot of stuff we wanted to do. There was like 10 of us on the team. I was the only designer. We wanted to do subscriptions. We wanted to fix onboarding. We wanted to release new stuff on Android. We wanted to fix the web app. We, someone needed t-shirts, right? This is a startup space. We had so many things we wanted to do, but ultimately we had to pick what was the most important thing to drive. And the thing that made the business move forward was getting more subscribers. So we had this conversation every quarter and I, you know, finally would, would convince my, my, uh, my bosses that we needed to focus on increasing subscriptions. And so we focused on getting people into these annual subscriptions and we were only successful when we focused on that as our primary target. And we were able to say, deflect other work, right? We're not going to do that because that's not our goal right now. Hand in hand with goals is the ability to prioritize work. Something I see like so often it breaks my heart in a thousand pieces is task trackers loaded up with low impact work, just packed with tickets that will not drive the goal or the business forward, right? And this is where the user, you as a growth designer, sometimes you have to say, yeah, maybe that thing is problematic. It might cause one or two users pain, but I'm focused on the 50,000 or the 5 million that are over here, right? Not the two that might interact with that sad error page or whatever it is. So you always want to be looking at how is the stuff we're doing today, tomorrow, this week, this month, driving impact, not features. We want to drive impact outcomes. How are we driving our goal? So you might ask, is this the most important thing to work on right now? It's at the top of the backlog. Does it drive impact for us? Who will this help? What is our goal? 
What impact will this have? Could that wait? How does this help our goal? Could we talk to our priorities? How are we measuring this? What is this for? Where does this come from? What is the expected? Blah, 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 right? You want to ask, what is this for? Who is it helping? How does it drive us forward? Um, and it's super easy to just sort of like go about your day and be like, well, we shipped a task. Mark is complete, right? We have a retro. We do it all over again. That's ultimately not how you move stuff forward. You constantly have to be like, guys, guys, what are we doing here? And is it helping the goal? Once you have that clear sense, you can then go in and investigate all of the gaps. So you have your goal, you have a sense of, of what's missing, you're gonna focus on subscriptions, you're gonna focus on signups, you're gonna focus on referrals, and you can sort of slice the mystery of what's going on there in all these different ways. And the three we're gonna talk about are quantitative, qualitative, customer research, and competitive research. You can't get satisfaction because this is a journey that you are taking forever. Um, you're always uncovering stuff, right? This isn't like a phase in your project. This is just the lifelong journey of discovery. So one of the key skill sets here is quant research. Um, looking at your analytics reports, right? So you usually, hopefully, fingers crossed, you have your, your key metrics set up somewhere where you can see, okay, this is our team goal. Here's how we're doing against that goal. But you want to go farther than that. You want to look at that and you want to dig into it and figure out what you can learn from the data. So this is an example from Amplitude. Um, Amplitude is a self-serve analytics tool. In this view, I'm looking at a funnel where a bunch of people played a song um, in, a, in a tool like Spotify, let's say, and then you know less than half purchased a song. So there's a huge drop off here. This doesn't tell me much. All this says is that a bunch of people left. I don't know why. I don't know where they went. And with Amplitude and many other tools, you can dig in. You can say, show me where these people who left went. And I can look at this and say, oh, okay. You know, a lot of people just bounced, but some people did other stuff. They favorited songs. They looked at ads, right? Maybe they shared something with someone. They looked for other songs. And this can start to give you clues. Where are people going? This helped me when I was working with the Black Tux. I learned that a bunch of people were leaving checkout but they weren't just leaving the website. They were going shopping again. They were, they were like not done shopping. They were going to check out because they didn't have anywhere else they could see the total cart value that they had added to their cart. And that was a flaw in the UX that we could bring that up earlier in the product, right? So it can give you ideas as a designer. Oh, that might be what's happening there. Let me go look at this view ad. What's going on there? Oh, this might be what's going on. Let's write an experiment plan and find out. Or let's go in and talk to these customers, right? This is another way that you can look at that. You can see these user journeys. You can say, I really want to talk to these people. I'm going to make a cohort and I'm going to get their user IDs. I'm going to email them and interview them. Find out what's going on. Customer research, right? So the, the emphasis on customer research for growth the most interesting customer research you can do is asking about people's scenarios and situations. It's not about usability or a UI. And I think that this is maybe another difference between product design and, and the growth specialization is that I find that a lot of designers place their user research emphasis on, I've got a UI, I want people to look at the UI and tell me that they can use it. In growth, the, the biggest sort of like aha moments come when you take a customer development approach, um, like Steve Blank, if you're familiar with that. Those books are all linked in the resources. So from the Lean Startup School of Thought, we're asking about, in the case of Toyota, what's your morning commute like? You know, how far do you work from your home? What's painful about it? You know, what's the most painful part of your commute? What's the most painful part of your day, right? You're looking for 
how big is this thing in their life? How much pain is it causing them? How much is, is your business and your product playing into their life, right? In the case of the black tux, the tuxedo company, most people are not spending their whole day thinking about tuxedos. And so they don't have a lot of tolerance for friction in the product. They're going to bounce and go to a competitor. They don't need to spend that much time on it. In the case of Toyota, the commute's a huge part of their day. It's a huge pain point. They're more willing to invest in that and to spend time solving for that. So customer development is the type of customer research that I would recommend folks focus on for growth. It's really about scenarios, pain points, the customer's life and, and their viewpoint, not our solution, RUI. And you also want to add to this all of the channels, right? Customer support, reviews, social media. Um, this, is, this is an ongoing journey where you're just, you're digging stuff up and you're trying to piece the puzzle together. And every week you're like, you know, maybe this week I'll dig into this tag in our customer support tool. Maybe I'll look at our Twitter or Facebook comments. And you're continually informing your view of who these people are, what their lives are like, how they're approaching your product or service. Along those lines, you also wanna keep an eye on competitors. This again, is a thing I think designers sort of like check a box off at the beginning of a project. Well, we did competitive research. This is a continual monitoring of the market. Jamie Levy, my former UX professor, talks about this a lot. Um, and in her book, UX Strategy, she breaks this down along with a whole toolkit about how to do it. And what you're looking for here is not a UI comparison of your company and another company. It's about value propositions. What's the value that this other alternative is offering your customers? Why would someone take BART in San Francisco rather than drive their Toyota, right? What is the, what is the trade-off there? What value are they getting from that other thing? So you want to keep an eye on this, both your direct competitors, your indirect competitors, um, and other influencers, right? What are companies doing that are just interesting in tech, right? Like Warby Parker with their home try-on, that was pretty innovative. Is there something you can learn from that that you could try at your company? This is sort of like where you're, you're really trying to think a little bit more like an entrepreneur, maybe a little bit less like a designer. Um, measurement. This is like the, the biggest gap I see for designers. I just find that designers tend to not learn analytics. That's why this meetup is so exciting um, and why everyone should be attending UX and data and starting it in their own cities because more designers need to get their hands on data, feel empowered by it, um, get involved and learn about it. And if I leave you with just one thing, that's the thing I want you to have is the data is really empowering. It's not intimidating or try to be less intimidated by it if you are. Data is not just about money as we talked about, we'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, there's two concepts I just really wanna leave you with on the data side. Obviously data is a whole field um, with so much to learn, so much to learn. But I think for designers, there's just a couple of things that I, I find helpful. One of those, is the idea of instrumentation, the concept of instrumentation. Instrumentation is the practice of coming up with instructions of how to measure and track behavior in your product or service. I'm gonna give you an example from the Black Tux. Um, this is like sort of an abbreviated homepage to add product flow. So as a designer, I'm looking at this, I've been tasked with improving it. I need to know where I'm losing people. I need to know what they're interacting with at the time that I'm losing them. And I want to know as much as I can about them. So for Black Tux, I want to know, is this person planning a wedding? Are they going to prom? Are they doing a special event? Um, are they going to log in or do they, are they signing up for the first time? What buttons are they clicking on? What products are they browsing? 
in order to do and know all that, someone has to instrument events and decide what those should be. And so um, I am super involved in this. Many designers are not that involved in this, but I think it's important to just know that this is a step someone on your team or a group of people on your team have to go through. And there are new products that are trying to make this easier. Um, but this is, this is not just like a given that things are tracked. It is, it's a whole practice that is happening. And so you can sort of choose how much you want to participate in it. Um, but when you do participate in it, you can understand the data because you've, you've been learning what that piece of data is called um, or whether or not it's being tracked or whether or not what you want to track is, is being tracked. When you track that information, um, it goes into an analytics tool. I think the most interesting analytics to focus on as a designer is analytics that are geared towards design, towards product makers, um, which you know can be called behavioral analytics. Um, tools like Amplitude, like Mixpanel, um, even Google Analytics would fit into this. And where this comes into play is when someone says, oh, we have a huge gap here. Or when your team says, wow, this test really failed. What do we do with this information? <laughs> My dog's having a dream. What do we do? How do we act on that, right? So, so I had a test when I was at the Black Tux that I thought was just going to crush everything. I told my whole team I was going to jump off a cliff if this test didn't just crush all of our dreams. And it tanked. It tanked within hours. And that left me going, well, well, what does that mean? Why did that? Why was I so wrong about that? And this is where you go into your analytics tool and you slice the data as many ways as you can. You look at errors. You look at time on page. You look at who these people were, where they came in from. You slice it every way you can. You try to get information. You reach out and interview them. You use analytics as your investigation tool, not just as a readout of how you did. And then in our last space, which we'll talk about very briefly, shipping to learn. Experimentation, that's a hallmark of growth. So it's important to be aware of what those techniques are and how you can participate in those. And sometimes we have to kill our darlings, which is very hard for designers to do, right? We, we're so passionate about something, we think it's gonna work, like I did at Black Tux, I thought this was gonna crush, and then our dreams are crushed because sometimes we're wrong about stuff. And it can be really expensive to be wrong about stuff. When you spend a lot of time, you know, you get paid money, your teammates get paid money, the business is expecting return on that money. So it's expensive when we, when we do the wrong thing. The longer we do the wrong thing, it's expensive. So the goal is to take smaller risks, to validate and measure that we're on the right path, that we're getting signal, that we're right um, before we just invest in a two year long redesign of something. Um, this is one way that you can do that doing prototype testing, looking at ways that are beyond just A-B testing. This is a prototype that I did uh, when I was at Prosper, which I ended up turning into a clickable prototype. Uh, that is something that designers are doing all the time, prototype testing. Um, and you can look at landing pages, you can do surveys, you can do feature fakes where you just build a little bit of the feature and see if people interact with it. Um, you could do interviews, there's an infinite number of ways to learn that you're on the right track about an idea and just familiarize yourself with what's out there. There's a couple books I put in the resources about testing ideas and there's tons of blog posts on experimentation. Just know that there's way more options available to you beyond A-B testing and usability testing. And lastly, as you test and learn, as you get new information from your competitive research, from your data, follow through 
and build on what you've learned. Make sure you're taking time to look at how experiments perform, to look at releases, and to ask critical questions. Why did this fail? Why did this succeed? What should we do next, right? How do we build on this? This is something we were always doing um, at Toyota, sort of pulling back and going, are these assumptions still correct? Are we still right about this? Are we looking in the wrong space? This can be a good thing to do with your team, maybe like once a month, um, even once a quarter. Did we pick the right goals? How's this going, right? Pulling up from the work and reflecting. Just wanna highlight a couple of resources. If you're interested in growth design, we have a whole community at growthdesigners.co. We've got jobs, we've got a Slack channel. People like book recommendations. These are the four that I recommend. Um, and I have some more, I think, at the link. Design Driven Growth, I think, is the only book that I know of that's specifically about growth design. And there's the link again. LexRoman.com slash resources. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Lex. That was awesome. We've yeah, got... thank you. I, I cut so much time from the Q&A. <laughs> That's all right. Um, we'll go for a little over as long as people are still around. Um, we've got quite a few questions in the Q&A. So I'll start from the top. Um, so Elaine asked, isn't solving for the customer the same as solving for the business? Shouldn't they be one and the same? Um, can something solve for your business if it doesn't work for your customer? Solving for your customer is not the same as solving for your business. Let me think about the second part of the question. Is What was the second part of the question? Is solving for the customer? Can something solve for your business if it doesn't work for the customer? Uh, yes. So unfortunately, what was happening in growth before was that custom, you know, customers have been tricked into buying stuff. Like for, you know, actually for the history of sales, customers have been tricked into buying stuff they didn't want or need, right? Like uh, Tupperware parties or Mary Kay cosmetics, or they, like that's sort of classic examples of people being sort of swindled into purchasing stuff that wasn't really that useful for them, but, but works for the business. It turns out that's not like a very sustainable business practice. Um, and that's not what, what we want to be advocating as designers. Solving the important part of your question, though, is that you can absolutely solve for customers in a way that does not help your business whatsoever. Um, for example, if you work at Netflix, it's not that healthy to be watching TV all the time. So the right thing for your customer might be to send them outside or send them to school or send them to work to get their job done. Uh, but that doesn't really help Netflix's bottom line. So that's the challenge that we're up against. We're trying, to, we're trying to strike the balance between, well, as Netflix, we want people to watch as much as possible. Uh, but as human beings, <laughs> we're not going to just force everyone to watch TV 24-7. So how do we strike that balance? And, and one way that they did that is they have that screen that comes up that's like, are you still there? Are you still watching? Which is sort of an indicator that you've maybe been watching TV for too long. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it can kind of get into some ethical areas there. It totally does. And that's why I think it's really great when designers are involved, because I, I think as designers, we can push back a little bit and say, this doesn't feel very human centric. This, you know, is there another way we could go about doing this um, that would that would solve for the business too, still? Uh, Vanessa asks, are there researchers in this growth space? And if so, what is their function? How are they working with and supporting growth designers? There totally are. I definitely have come across growth um, researchers, growth UX researchers. Um, and then there's market researchers too that are working you know, more on the marketing side. Um, most of the teams that I've worked with personally don't even really have dedicated UX research. So I don't, I don't know that I can speak to it too specifically, but I guess I would say that they would be growth practitioners just like anyone else and that they would need to be focused on that intersection of customer and business value, not just customer pain. I think that's just the biggest difference. It's not enough to be like, these are the customer pain points. It's the intersection of this is the missed business opportunity and here's why customers are leaving at that place. 
but yeah, there are, and there are maybe a couple roles up on the jobs page, but I know HubSpot has a UX researcher for growth and I'm sure a few other companies do too. You have one at Capital One, UX researcher for growth. Not, uh, I mean, it's not labeled that way, but yeah. I think there are aspects of this that come into that. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, he writes growth designer, um, niche to UX slash UI designer slash UX researcher slash strategist question mark. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, people have a really strong reaction to this, this idea of a new, like similarly to if, if y'all are on social media and people are always debating what's a UI designer, what's a UX designer, right? Like what, what are these titles? Are they meaningless? I, I found the growth design term helpful in describing the type of work I wanted to do and was good at. And it turns out that a lot of other folks feel as I do that they identify with this skill set and they want jobs doing this work and, and companies are interested in this. Um, so yes, I think it's a specialization and it's not usually called growth designer. That's not usually the title. And to, to your point, Kim, there's plenty of people inside organizations that are operating like this day to day that don't have the title. Um, but I think it's just helpful. It's mostly helpful when you're looking for work or when you're hiring to be like, this is the kind of specialization I'm interested in. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, and envision we had people that were really great at motion, really great at illustration. Um, but, but I'm not that. That's not the kind of designer I am. I'm focused on data and using data to drive um, customer experience. And so, like, I think it's most helpful in that space. It's more helpful to have that vocabulary than, than to be like a product designer with a clunky bio that people are ignoring. That's sort of where it's most useful, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think it... it, it there's a distinction and pulls it away from that generalist kind of designer towards something different. Yeah. People, cause people don't know when you say you're a product designer, it's like, well, are they good at UI? Are they good at research? Right. Like, are they front end developers secretly? Like what's the, who are you really? Uh, somebody asked with birth design, how can you design for inclusion? If you're designing for the majority, you want the most vulnerable to be left behind. That is a great question. I think that designing for inclusion is really challenging, whether or not you're working on growth. Um, I think it's an important thing to center in your practice and it's important thing for us all to be getting way better at. Um, it, I think that a couple of things, one is that hopefully it's a thing that the whole design team is owning and the whole product making team is owning. That's not just like one growth designer that's owning that, that it's a practice that, that is organizationally practiced or advocated for beyond one individual. The other thing is that what's cool about being a growth designer is that you can advocate for stuff like that by making a business case. So you can, you can figure out, like when I was at Burner, for example, I, had, I was doing so much work with our customer support tickets that I found several users who were like, I'm using a screen reader and I can't understand any of the menu options. Well, guess what? They don't buy subscriptions if they can't understand the menu options. So, like that's really easy to make a case around. Um, and that's, it's way more powerful to be like, Hey, people who are using screen readers aren't buying stuff. Then we need to fix the stuff for people with screen readers because they, because money talks. So <laughs> if, if you can make that case, it's powerful. Well, and also dining, designing for inclusion can be better for the majority. That's the whole point, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes, so. that's the whole point. Yeah, so totally. I think that's the, there's a lot of empowering, but I do think that we need to get better. We need to get better at prioritizing that. Yeah. Uh, Marcia asks, can one designer function as both a product designer and growth designer, or should the, these roles be separated out? Hmm. It depends. I think it depends on the designer. I, um, the thing is like, it's really hard to do growth work. It's really hard to be like, it, it's really hard to say, you know, a black tux we're, we want to make this much money in revenue. That's a really hard thing to own. And so it's not possible to like drive that and to like make sure the customer support website is great and to fix the forgot password link and to make sure the emails are good. So I think it comes down to, how you're goal setting and prioritizing. Um, 
because ultimately as, as a growth practitioner, you don't want to be doing low impact work. You would like for that to be on another team. It's just like, it's almost like a different cadence of working. Someone's working fast to test ideas and someone's working slower to make sure that they're well executed. So do you think it's more about that cadence or is there actually any inherent conflict in, in the motivation of the work itself? I think that only conflict is that product designers have to make sure that the, the whole product works. Like, um, for example, Zoom has a chat and a Q&A feature. Do you think that if they had one or the other, people would buy less subscriptions to Zoom? I, probably not. But someone has to build those two features or someone decided to do that. So there's a designer who has to work on Q&A. And if there's a bug on the Q&A feature, right, I'm looking at this Q&A panel, it's not great. If someone's like, we're going to redesign that, right. are you really going to be able to prove a connection to subscriptions? That's going to be ultimately low impact work. But maybe someone thinks that's important. And that's in conflict with the designer who's trying to drive up subscriptions. So it's just, I think it's just like, ultimately there's some work that you can't measure but still yeah. needs to get done and and that is where product designers are needed and growth designers are less needed or people that specialize in that are less needed uh, valerie asks, do you often work with analysts in cro conversion rate optimization seems like a lot of overlap i don't um work in organizations that would have those <laughs> functions described that way but yes conversion rate optimization is the mar is marketer speak for like for getting people to do stuff um so if there were analysts on my team then yes i would work with them i tend to work with really small organizations so i don't really have analysts at all which is why i've gotten so involved in data yeah. but yeah there's a lot of overlap here and i i we just emphasize that the growth of design is a new framing, um, particularly geared towards designers of work that's been getting done by other roles, marketers, data practitioners, engineers, and PMs mainly. Uh, Chris asks, do you have any insights on how customer research is different in a B2B space when the user is not the customer and their experiences may be very different? Yes. If I had a nickel for every time I got a B2B question during a Q&A on growth design, I'd be <laughs> <laughs> So um, a couple of things. One is that that design driven growth book has a whole section on B2B because Molly Norris Walker, who wrote that, recognizes that B2B growth design is becoming really popular and is, and there's a lot of questions about how to do it. So if you're in the B2B space, I recommend her book, um, Design Driven Growth. I think it's design-driven-growth.com and it's, I think it's on the resources page. The main thing in B2B is that you have a huge opportunity to tap into your sales team um, if you're using sales, which I think most B2B companies are. So when I worked at Envision or I worked with the team at Gusto, um, the sales team becomes like a huge source of information and ideas where they are talking to the buyer and sometimes also the user and you can get a sense of what's going on there. And I think the sales team also offers insight into, you know, when they're pitching certain features and people are getting excited about that, that's the thing that's driving sales. So that's the thing that's driving growth. Um, and that tends to be slightly more qualitative than maybe measuring something in the product. But I think sales is the biggest opportunity and they can be such a huge ally um, for growth practitioners. Uh, Michael asks, what is your method of getting quality consumers to interview? I would only talk to your actual customers. I think the biggest problem is that people talk to random people online. And so if you're talking to people that are hitting your website or in your app, then they're your customers on some level or their prospective customers. So that would be my answer. Like always talk to people that are actually have demonstrated interest in your product via an ad or landing page, social media, or are already have already signed up and then left for some reason, or, or maybe bought something. Uh, Alex asks, how do you start growing your skills in instrumentation and behavioral analytics space? Yeah, that's a big question. I put some resources on the page, uh, on the resources page. I, um, I actually made my own class in this exact thing because I, I saw a big gap there. So I offer a class on my website in that. 
but also Segment, the analytics company, has a website. It's called Segment Analytics Academy, also should be linked in the resources, um, which is free and is a great resource for learning about analytics. But I think the main thing is to do it. And if you're working, um, it's easier if you're working. I don't know how many folks are working or looking for jobs, but, but if you're working, I would just lean on your teammates and say, hey, I'm interested in learning about this. Can I pair with you? Can I watch you do this? Can we talk about how this is done? You know, don't feel like you have to like learn this all and then come back to work. You can ask and lean on other folks. But no one expects designers to have this stuff. So it's like a bonus if you're interested in it. Yeah, well, I'm probably having that real world uh, aspect of it is gonna be more helpful than- Yeah, it's really the, hard to nice learn. Station. I think it's really hard to learn. Um, although you can sort of get familiar with it, but yeah, it's hard to learn without the need. You could instrument though your portfolio website. Like if you're looking for a job, you can use GA and sort of start learning about it uh, that way. That's free. Uh, Alice says, I work closely with a PM and he tracks the metrics and analyzes the success of a release. It feels like there's a lot of overlap as a PM versus growth designer. What would you say the main difference is between the two roles? The main difference is design. So um, PMs don't design, designers design. I mean, that's the main difference. I, I sort of see product managers and designers broadly are you familiar with the, um, why am I blanking on his name? Alan Cooper model of design, where it's like generators and synthesizers. Have you I've heard, heard of it like yeah. on a very high level, but I don't know all the details of it. So they run or they ran, I think they still do, these pairs of designers um, on projects. One is a generator, someone who's more in the exploratory space. And one is a synthesizer who's more in the like convergent solution space. And I sort of think of PMs and designers in general like that, where PMs are the generators and designers are the synthesizers. Um, but ultimately, PMs don't design. I mean, like, I, I tend to practice in a very fluid way where I don't feel like a huge amount of ownership and I'm fine with PMs getting involved in design. But like, ultimately, the main difference is that designers design and actually produce mock-ups and create the actual design. And PMs generally have ideas and contribute, but don't like physically produce that. That would be the main thing. Uh, Michelle says, how do you incorporate a growth design mindset when you talk directly with customers through interviews and surveying? I would think like an entrepreneur and I would read the lean startup stuff. So, so the book, the lean startup, I like running lean also, which is really thin and gives um, this, this idea of a problem interview where you're, you're really poking out the scenarios, the pain points, like who this person is, what their life is like. I would focus on that rather than on your UI. I think that's the biggest mistake I see designers make. They're like, oh, it's all about my UI. This person is like looking at every aspect of my UI and they're just not, people don't care. They're really busy and they don't have time to give a crap about your UI. So you can sit there and make them focus on your UI, or you can learn that they have a two month old baby and they're not gonna ever pay as much attention to the UI as they are during your interview. And, and you can only do that by sort of trying to meet them where they are and, and hear about their, like ask open-ended questions, right? Like, what was your day like? What do you do for a living? You know, you know do it around the thing that you're exploring. But um, I think also keeping interviews lightweight, allowing flexibility, not being like, oh, this is an hour long interview. You have to have this whole setup, right? When I was at Gusto, we're, Gusto does um, payroll for small businesses. So we were just like really flexible with when they could talk to us. I would talk to people that were like in the back of their restaurant on the phone. And it's like that you're like in the scenario, right? You're hearing how busy that person is. You're hearing them talk to other people. Like they're not going to read a whole thing on your platform when you, when you know that that's what their life is like. So that's the biggest thing. Like throw away your usability test because like, let someone else do that. I think that's important, but the most, the secrets are in the like human understanding. Uh, Victoria asks, where do growth designers sit in the company's organization? How do growth teams and growth designers work with other teams, especially if a high impact opportunity may fall under another team's product line? It really depends. So a lot of companies still don't have this specialization. So, so some product teams might be assigned a growth goal for a quarter. 
um, like Envision did this. They sort of got rid of their growth team and then, and then they were like, all teams are growth teams, which, which really means that no team is a growth team um, unless you're Netflix, which actually does that pretty well. Uh, so it sort of, it sort of depends. You, you can have like teams with really aggressive goals, teams with less aggressive goals. Um, Pinterest does it by assigning teams very specific growth ownership areas so i think they have like i'm gonna get these names wrong but for example the activation team the retention team and the referral team or something like that so they have teams that are focused on different parts of this. so they're not even necessarily called growth teams but they're they're driving a part of the growth some companies just have a growth team um, and some companies are too small to have that so they they just focus like when i was a burner being the only designer and at one point, the PM too, you know, we didn't have a growth team. We were just all doing growth. And so it, it kind of depends. And I, I would say that it's like, it's not, there's no like industry-wide, like nailed it answer to this. It's just, it really differs. And I think the thing to do is like, look at your organization and be like, why are we working on low impact stuff? Why am I personally working on low impact stuff? Could we be doing this better? How might this work differently? You'll be surprised. I mean, I feel like as an individual contributor, I've had the ear of CEOs when I've been like, I think the teams could be set up like this. What do you think? And they'll be like, yeah, maybe. Like, so <laughs> we'll try it, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if you're going to have impact on the business. <laughs> I'm people sure love it. As soon as you're like, that. hey, I have an idea where we can make more money. And people are like, okay, yeah. let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Vincent asks, do I need to know UX before growth design? Can I get to growth design straight from brand design? Maybe if you're going to work on a marketing team, I mean, growth design can be products. So I'm a product side growth designer. Like I work, I work post, you know, post marketing sort of like, like someone brings me the customers and then I turn them into customers. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you're going to work with a marketing team on like ads and marketing pages, I think you, you could come from brand design. Got two more questions. Uh, Roland asks, isn't design maturity of the company crucial to give the designer the support to drive growth related efforts? Uh, early startups are 100% sales driven and product design is mostly spot UX design. I don't know what spot UX design means. Sure. Um, does that mean something to you, Kim? Uh, not, not sure what that means. I mean, I think that design maturity is crucial to give designer support in general. That's sort of the point. Design gets the least amount of support, I think, in a lot of organizations, at least when you're talking about the product production teams. Um, design leadership tends to get hired late. You know, there's just like not a lot of support for designers. And I think the design out of like product data, I mean, product managers would probably have an issue with this. But I just think design is like generally misunderstood and not supported well in a lot of organizations. So yes, I think that's critical for designers and, it, and it's critical for growth designers too. The biggest thing that I've seen is that, and this is like partially why I do talks like this, because I was like, I got really excited about growth design like four years ago. And then I was like, wow, like there's very few people doing growth at all and like owning it like very few. And so when I go in, I end up teaching growth to like engineers and data scientists and product managers and my bosses. And, and that can be really hard. It can be really hard to have to teach leadership growth. And so that's where the biggest gap is, is leaders, leaders, not just design leaders, but engineering and product leaders, knowing what growth is and knowing how to support growth as a practice. Uh, Nathan says, what's the best way to get experience growth hacking? Uh, if one currently doesn't have the opportunity, what can one do outside of the normal nine to five to get the exposure and add to one skill set? And I think you kind of covered this a little bit before. So. Well, it's funny because I would have before I would have been like nothing. You have to work in a company. <laughs> but I think two things. One is like you could totally work with a nonprofit. Nonprofits need donations and you can drive a lot of donations with you know, running tests, you can do pre post tests, if you can't afford an AB testing tool, meaning that you ship something, you look at it over a week or two, and then you ship something else and compare. Um, you can instrument Google Analytics, you could do it 
you could be pretty lightweight with that stuff. Um, so a nonprofit can be one way. And the other way is to work with, I'm working, the people's budget is a grassroots coalition. So no one gets paid. And so I like for sure can't buy analytics tools and stuff like that, but we're just using a WordPress site and I just change the content there and we're, you know, monitoring site visits and activity. Um, so we're doing, we're sort of like operating a little bit more in a startup space. I would say those two things, nonprofits and grassroots coalition. And there's so much impact to be driving right now. I don't know where you're based, Nathan, but there's a ton of people that need web designers and social media design to drive forward change in the community. So there's a lot, there's a lot you can do there. We will end there. So thank you so much, Lex. This is awesome. Um, if you haven't uh, had a chance to peek at the chat, there are lots of great comments thanking you for this talk. Um, so this is awesome. Uh, thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, just a quick announcement. Uh, our sibling meetup, Data and the Greater Good, will have its next virtual event on Wednesday, July 15th. Uh, with Data at Pause, a discussion of the use of data to end the killing of homeless pets uh, and to match pets with loving homes. So um, please join us for that event. And um, this event was recorded and we'll be sharing that out as soon as Bill has a chance to edit it together. So um, thank you again, Lex. This was super fun. I'm glad we had a chance to, to have you with us. Yeah, I'm psyched to be here. Thank you so yeah, much. Awesome. So um, have a good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, bye. Good night.